We are now going to move on to the operation that is the cause of the most pain for the most people in this, which is the if-then statement. This is the foundation of mathematical logic, and it, in some cases, feels like it doesn't make sense in English. We'll try to address those when we start trying to translate some of these sentences from English to mathematics. For now, we can just pretend this is a symbol and it has certain properties and ignore any English at all. But let's try and see what's going on here. So we have two variables, P and Q. We've got this weird symbol where we have P and then an arrow and then Q. This arrow somewhat implies that there's a direction to what is occurring, and that is important. We're trying to say if P is true, then Q must always be true. That is the thing we are trying to assert. So let's write down our column, same as we did. True, true, false, false, true, false, true, false. So we have P implies Q. What we want to do is that that statement is true as long as P is true, meaning Q is true. So in this first row, hopefully we can agree that some, a sentence like, if it rains, then the grass is wet, is something that is true. So we're going to call that true. That example gives this false idea that there's a causality, though. And because of that, I'm going to use something slightly different, which is I'm going to say something like, if x is positive, then x squared is positive, or x cubed is positive. Might even be a better example. If x is positive, then x cubed is positive. So if you give me a number, 5, I know with certainty that 5 cubed is also going to be positive. That's the thing we're trying to assert, that type of idea of when this property is true, this other thing is always true. And we're trying to say whether or not that idea of implication holds. The next one hopefully won't be too bad either, which is the idea of true implying false. We're trying to say whenever P is true, Q must also be true. In that column though, we have P is true and Q is false. So this implication is going to be false. That's like saying that five is positive, that's my x, and then five cubed is somehow negative. That's not how mathematics works, so that is a statement that is false. You can't say if x is positive, then x cubed is positive, and then give me uh, something that violates that. The last two rows are the reason people tend to find this confusing. The idea that p being true means q must be true, most people hold. The thing that is strange about these last two is that if p is false, we make no assumptions about Q. So in both of these instances, I don't care what Q does. It is irrelevant. What happens is that the statement is true. And this might seem counterintuitive, but in sort of English slang, then this is occurs in sort of, I don't know, old boomer talk a little bit of things like, if that's true, then I'm the Queen of England. So, you know, someone says that they aced an exam and you're trying to call them out on it. This is a common thing that you might do. Like, if that's true, then pigs can fly. Or if that's true, then some other random absolute nonsense. It doesn't matter what you say afterwards. But you're assuming that the start of the sentence is false. If you start your implication with a false premise, it does not matter what you conclude. As another example, I could say things like, if I'm president of the United States, then the sky is purple. Sure, I don't care if the sky is purple or not. Maybe it is some days, maybe it's not. But I'm not the president of the United States. That statement's still true because I, what I said originally was false for the premise, the hypothesis, what some people might call the antecedent. That's the fancy math word. I like premise or hypothesis because those fit more with sort of scientific notation a little bit. But the technical term would be antecedent. So with this in mind, let's really quickly do one last column for Q is implied by... The arrow is often read as implies, or you can sometimes say if P then Q. So the first one would be if P then Q. The second one you would also read as if P then Q, at least I would, even though the letters are not in that order, only I find that easiest to do. You can also say, like I said, Q is implied by P, or P implies Q. There's many different English ways to read this symbol. So let's do Q 
is implied by P. And if you look, this, this table, while we might have had to spend some time reasoning about why the hell the column is what it is, there's only one thing we need to look for, which is where the start is true, the base of the arrow is true, and the head of the arrow is false. And because I didn't reorder the symbols, this is actually exactly the same as the first set of symbols. So we have the exact same truth table that results. The thing to notice here is that the order of variables matters. That was not true for or or and. Sort of really combining prepositions there a little bit. Prepositions? Sure. <laughs> uh, the order of your variables matters. As a quick example, you can't say if it is an iPhone, then it is a smartphone, and then switch that to if it is a smartphone, then it is an iPhone. Even if statistically iPhone might be the most popular phone in America, it doesn't make that statement true. The start and the end of an if-then statement really matter which one is which. You can't change the symbols. You need to be careful what is the start of the if and what is the end of the then. Which part is the if and which part is the then.